All right, guys. I think we are live. First order of business. I wonder if um, you guys can actually hear me well. Um, it seems like an adventure every single time we set up to do one of these uh, live broadcasts. Um, something always seems to be changing and different. And today, I'm seeing something different uh, with my audio levels. So hopefully, you guys can hear me OK. If you can't, just let me know, and I will see what I can do. But um, yeah, where to begin? So right now, uh, the time is 3 p.m. Eastern Standard. It's May 2nd. So if you're watching the stream right now and it's not really that time where you're at, um, you're probably watching the rebroadcast, uh, which is fine. Um, you just won't be able to, uh, to chat with us on YouTube. Um, but there's a good chance that uh, a lot of what you see on this live sale, it's going to be still available after this show um, on TitleGardens.com. So speaking of, let's uh, take a moment and go, kind of go over the, the rules and whatnot. So let's see. So this is how the live sale is going to work. Uh, you can watch and chat with us live on YouTube. So it's YouTube.com slash TitleGardens. Uh, but I also recommend if you wanted to purchase corals to have TitleGardens.com open as well. In the top left of the navigation, um, you can see uh, um, a link for the live sale. The, and like once you get there, you can see an Im embedded video of, of this thing. And um, all 153, I believe, uh, different types of corals that we're going to be showcasing today. Um, so if you go there, what you'll see is um, th all the corals are just numbered with their quantity and price. So technically, you can buy them blind if you wanted to. But um, over the course of this live sale, we're going to be going over exactly what each of those are. So uh, you might want to wait and see when we get there, I guess. So shipping, I get asked about shipping a lot. Uh, it's $39.99 flat rate but it's free for orders over 250. So the way that that's gonna work um, when you're purchasing corals is um, you can select the shipping option, which is local pickup slash live sale, and that zeroes out uh, the shipping cost. And so once you're, you're done um, buying up all your different corals, there's a, a shipping, uh, $39.99 shipping module that you can add in. Um, you don't need to add it in, obviously, if your total is over 250. But that's, uh, that's an actual item that you just toss in to your last order, and then that takes care of your shipping requirement. Um, yeah, so that was number four there with the select local pickup live sale. Number five uh, I should address is that in order to actually get the item, you have to check out with it. It's not good enough to just to have it in your shopping cart till the very end. You have to constantly be checking out. So um, it's okay if you have like five orders at the very end you add in your shipping or something like that. So that kind of covers the rules. I'll go over this again a couple more times during the show for the people that kind of like straggle in a little bit late. Um, like I mentioned, uh, you can chat with us live at youtube.com and there's like a little chat window there. So. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be checking chat occasionally here. I'll, I'm trying to get better at it because I kind of have to like dig around on the different windows on my screen. But yeah, I think that'll work. So what we did last time um, on the live sale, which kind of worked out nicely, was we were going um, kind of uh, in order by different types of corals. Before, we, it was kind of like a mishmash of different corals, but now we've kind of got them into groups where it can kind of discuss all the corals, um, like all Acroporus, for example, which is the first guy here. Uh, this is the purple bonsai, and we've got three of these available. So Acropora, um, they are a somewhat challenging coral, I would say. Most folks, uh, are going to want an aquarium with some pretty good lighting, high intensity lighting, strong flow, um, and really stable water conditions. Uh, these guys do really well when the, the tank has been aged for about a year at least. Um, and I say that they're challenging because um, they tend to be rather sensitive and it's possible that a, a colony would be doing great. It'll grow for like 
you know, three to six months, get 10 times the original size, and then suddenly get one of like the really common Acropora diseases like slow tissue necrosis or rapid tissue necrosis, that's STN or RTN you might hear online. So that can be really, really frustrating. And it's not any indication of how good you are as an aquarist. I mean, really, really good aquarists with cost no object systems can struggle with these guys. So um, just putting that out there, it's, uh, it's by no means um, a super difficult coral or anything like that, but uh, it is definitely one of the more challenging corals that a lot of experts tend to, to struggle with occasionally. It's just one of those things. Okay. Um, moving on to the next one here. So just to give you a, a heads up, we um, are doing a ton more coral than usual. Like we're doing uh, probably four times as many coral total and about double as many types of corals. We're doing a lot of multiples. So you see this prismatic Acropora. It's, um, we have like five of these available. And so you can kind of see they're kind of stacked behind each other. Take my word for it. We found as many that were as similar as possible to the one that we're showing you. Um, so in all, there's probably like close to 400 corals. So it's a lot, lot more. And having said that, I want to try to keep on, on pace as much as I can. Next guy up is the woolly mammoth acro. You can see just by the, the, the different acros that we've shown so far that, um, you know, they, they vary a lot in their polyp extension. They'll vary a lot in their growth structure. Some of them form like really densely packed uh, uh, like sets of branches and, and things of that sort. Um, others uh, tend to plate. These guys that we've shown um, up to this point, they're gonna be uh, forming like well-branched uh, colonies. So that's kind of what you can ex expect once they get larger. Right now, these are just a little over an inch, but um, Acropora tend to grow really quickly when uh, all, the, all the water chemistry is right, your, your tank is aged properly, you're giving proper light, proper flow. Um, you will want to keep a close eye on water chemistry. Uh, moving on to number four here while I talk. Next coral, Matthew. Um, the, the water chemistry is important for these guys, so I would definitely keep an eye on three parameters. Um, magnesium, uh, calcium, alkalinity. That's kind of like the, that holy trinity of alkalinity in, in, in salt water. So you'll definitely want to get those c as close as you can to like about 420-ish um, calcium, at least 1,000 to 1,200 magnesium and a DKH of like roughly nine or 10. That's usually um, pretty close. And yeah, somebody's asking, are we only on number three? Yes, we're technically on number four. And moving on, this is the green Acropora millipora. Is it? Yes. So um, millipora, are kind of interesting, uh, and they're very, very popular acro uh, because they tend to be very furry. It's not quite as uh, hairy as like the, the woolly mammoth, but uh, they have like a single tentacle on each of their polyps that is a different color and is longer. So on this guy, for example, you can see those little streaks of white. That's very common in these uh, millipora. It's in, it was in the salmon millipora first, and as well as like this green uh, millipora here. So some people are just like addicted to millipora and they have their entire uh, SPS system dedicated to these guys. Moving on to number six, we've got these lime green acros. They look bleached, but take my word for it, they've been like this for months now and they see, this just seems to be their color. Um, if you're looking for something along the lines of um, a, a very, very light, near fluorescent uh, highlighter type coral. This is a pretty good one to, to check out. Uh, let's see, we have a couple of these. Uh, perhaps the, the overlay only says uh, we've got one, but I think that we have additional ones. There's three total. Yeah. Marowak7 says, Than for president in 2016. Yeah, like I want that job. Yeah, I'm actually really lucky. I wasn't born in the U.S., so I am absolutely, categorically not eligible. So, got off of that hook. Number seven. 
Uh, this guy is the frog skin acro. We'll dial in the exposure to, so you can see him a little better. Um, these guys I like a lot. They're, it's like an Australian acroporum that we probably have had for like five years or something now. And we've never seen it come around since, but I, I just like the, uh, the shape of these things for some reason. It's, it's, a, it's a very satisfying candy looking thing. Don't know why I think that, but I do. Yeah, moving on. By the way, if you guys have any questions about uh, acros or anything like that, feel free to toss them into the into the chat, um, or pretty much like any questions. Period. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm trying to get a lot better at reading chat, so we can we can handle it there. We've got our next guy here. It's one of the, our ice blues. I don't know how many more of these we're ever gonna have, so if you like this type of acro, you might wanna jump on it. It's a small one, it's probably like three quarter inch at best, but um, the, the acros that, that have like that really, really crisp blue color tend to be a little bit harder to find. Uh, next up, number nine. We got the Red Dragon. I remember when these guys were like shockingly expensive so um, this is a pretty good price for these, take my word for it. At one time these were a few hundred at least for like something that was one inch in size. So uh, if you're still um, looking for red dragons, this is a pretty good opportunity to pick those up. And why am I so small? So you can see the corals. <laughs> All right, moving on, number 10. We have the Oregon Tort. Uh, it's a small frag, but every single time that we frag an Oregon tort, no matter how small we frag it, it sells like within hours locally. The, 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 I can count on one hand how many times we've actually sold um, Oregon tort on our website because we've never been able to grow it out to any decent size before somebody locally wants to buy the tiniest nub of this stuff. So. We're actually going to be able to, to offer it um, online on a live sale just this once, probably. These things go so fast, it's ridiculous. It's been something that's been fragged for a long, long time, but it must be like the way that they import it or something where they don't really do well um, upon importing because I don't see a lot of these things come in. It's always through aquaculture. So I think we got ours probably from a frag swap or something, and we've been just propagating for like a really, really long time. Okay, next up, number 11. We're done with our acros. And this is a Pasilopora. If you were considering trying your hand at SPS and wanted to find something that has that branching look but doesn't necessarily require um, the same type of lighting or is nearly as sensitive as, say, like an Acropora or a Montipora, uh, this might be something that you can try. It'll give you the same relative shape, but these guys can be grown in pretty low light, as a matter of fact. They grow quickly, um, and they are much, much, much more resistant to, um, to, I guess, slightly neglected water quality, let's say. Something worth considering. Next guy is the pink Pasilopora. Again, like the green before it, um, a fairly easy SPS if you're going to be getting, um, getting into it. So one thing that these guys can do, a, a lot of different corals can do it, but these guys are kind of famous for it. It's called polyp bailout. They can actually hit the eject button and uh, basically launch themselves out of their, uh, off of the, the coralite and regrow elsewhere in the tank. They only do this if something's gone terribly wrong in your tank. So that's not a good way to, to go about propagating these guys or anything, but it is something that they can do and um, the, the mortality rate is a lot lower than you might think. I hear sirens, typical. Uh, next up, number 13. Very similar to Pasilopora is Stylophora. Um, 
I don't know why, but there are certain corals that I can just tell apart a mile away between the two. They look super duper similar to one another, but it's always so easy for me to see some hard to describe difference between these guys and tell them apart. I don't really know how to to describe it except maybe like the very tips of their tentacles uh, tend to be more highlighter like than the Pasolipora, maybe. There's there's gonna come some other ones later on that I will point out that I cannot at all tell the difference between. But when it comes to to stylos versus uh, Pasolipora, I can tell a difference. Next up is uh, number 14, not number four, I'm sorry, it's number 14. Uh, this is our rainbow stylo. Um, these guys change color a lot depending on their lighting. So right now they're mostly purple with a little bit of like a cream um, base. Uh, if you put them under higher lighting, they develop pink tips and that cream base turns more yellow. So uh, depending on, I guess, the intensity of lighting and the, and the spectrum that you're growing these under, they pick up like two to three additional colors. Sorry, that was number 14. Number 15. Okay, that's fine, capping it. Number 15, we will get to in a moment. Um, yeah, whoops, what? So, okay, so what's going on right now? We have to move the slider. So instead of giving you guys all motion sickness, we decided to, uh, to go ahead and cap the lens and we're moving our entire little setup down a bit. And once uh, we're uncapped, we're on to our next coral here. Which is number 15, I do believe. Yes. Bird of Paradise. We've got five of these guys available. Sea Crab Run, don't do any LPS yet. I need to eat something real fast. Hurry up. <laughs> no, actually, we've got uh, some LPS mixed in throughout. Uh, you've got at least, I don't know, 20-something corals maybe, so hurry. Bird of Paradise, okay. So we're gonna go over maybe like about four different types of, uh, of bird's nest that we have here. The Bird of Paradise is my personal favorite. It tends to be, um, like the most multicolor of all of them, kind of has that, uh, that, that uh, how should I say, like almost like a prismatic shimmery skin that like transitions from like teal to yellow to back to green and stuff. Uh, oftentimes it's got purple polyps as different colored tips and things. Very, very cool and fast growing. Next up, pink bird's nest. The nice thing about bird's nest, kind of like the stylos, kind of like the pasolipora, is that uh, they can be kept in um, a variety of different types of lighting. They're gonna change color pretty substantially. Um, like the pink, for example, probably could use more light to bring out that pink, um, but it's not gonna necessarily die if it's in um, too dark of an area or anything like that. They're fast growing, they have that, that classic SPS uh, branching shape. So another uh, coral that you might consider if you're just trying to get into the SPS game. Next up, number 17, is the yellow bird's nest. You can kind of see it's got these bright yellow polyps. Actually, the polyps are more green than yellow, but the skin um, is like a, a yellow color. And the more light that you guys give this, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, which um, may not be the best appearance for them. The best appearance that I've uh, been able to get with these guys tends to happen in much lower lighting. So something to consider there. And I I'm gonna use like high light, low light, um, it just as some general descriptor terms. Not everybody's got like a par meter or anything like that, but I consider medium light to be in that 100 range, about 75 to like 125 on the par meter. Um, anything over like 150 to 200 is going to be what I consider highlight and something in the 50 range is what I would consider low light so low light is pretty dim all right moving along number 18 is the panape bird's nest this colony 
it is probably the most sensitive to light when it comes right down to it. Uh, right now, this guy was, I can already tell, was in low light because it tends to have more of that purplish color. Um, under a much brighter light, this thing turns completely pink. So um, the, the color transitions ha happen all the way through. Um, you can get yellows, you can get purples, you can get greens, all by changing the light on this guy. Um, if you do want it something that's like almost like a fuchsia pink, just putting one of these guys in highlight would give you that. Um, it's a very, very distinct look. And it's got very, very pointy tips compared to some of the other, uh, other birds' nests. Okay. I'm trying to catch up on chat just a little bit, so if I pause, that's what that's all about. Okay, number 19, moving on. We've got our sky blue Hydnophora. Hydnophora is a little weird uh, SPS. Um, it's kind of unique in that it's polyp structure. They're called Hydnophores. Go figure, kind of makes sense. Um, this is a relatively, I don't know if it's a fast growing coral, I would say medium of the road, middle of the road, as far as SPS go in terms of growth rate. They are very hardy, but they're also super aggressive against other SPS. So if you are um, placing this colony and it happens to get in contact with any other type of SPS, it's going to absolutely crush it. So you really do have to place these guys carefully, make sure they don't fall off of, of whatever location they're on and onto another colony or anything like that. So um, very nice, very pretty, but they are aggressive. Okay, next up, it's the neon green hydnophora. The sky blue is a little bit more difficult to come by, but for whatever reason, we have a harder time getting the green, which is much more common. Um, yeah, just like the, uh, the sky blue, you'll want to watch out for coral placement. Um, as far as like flow and stuff, they, they're really pretty ambivalent when it comes to that sort of thing. They do well in different types of lighting. Um, but yeah, the, the, the aggression issue is probably like ch my chief concern. Uh, they don't really send out sweepers so much or anything. It's just really that direct contact. Okay. So people in chat are, are talking about uh, mandarins, I think. Yeah, you know what, we, ha we have mandarins. Um, I don't know how, how much I would recommend keeping mandarins because it's really amazing how much they're able to eat. Uh, number 21, by the way, <laughs> next score up, is our Duncan. Uh, mandarins, um, they eat copepods in your tank, but they eat so much that, like, unless you can get them onto another food source or, like, re reliably grow and culture um, the copepods for them, they tend to starve. And we have like thousand gallon systems and again even in systems that size it's sometimes difficult to keep them well fed so they are definitely a challenging fish long term duncans this guy here um, our, our, our next few i think are all going to be duncans just spoiler um, they are a really really cool australian lps um, this one here's got five heads i believe so it's about ten dollars a head uh, they came onto the scene, I don't know, like several years ago, and they've been really popular ever since. It's kind of a combination between kind of like an elegance and a candy cane or something. It's, it's kind of its, its own little animal. Yeah. Damonic says, I hear him fine, just a little quiet, so I, maybe I'll just try to speak up. Or I'll crank up my, my input volume just a little bit. Maybe that will help. Maybe, hopefully. Okay. So I just boosted up the volume, hopefully that helps. Next is our second Duncan. This guy's got four heads, slightly smaller in overall size compared to the, to the previous one, but still doing really well. Super duper healthy. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? All right, because hopefully, look, I'm just gonna bump up my volume here. I'm sitting further back also um, because I'm doing this green screen thing, so if I scoot too far forward, see, it cuts my face off. So, anyway, 
So hopefully you guys can hear me a little bit better. I'll speak up a, little, a bit. 23. Our last dunk in here. Five heads, probably the largest in terms of like, you know, footprint. Not really that much more in terms of polyps, but a uh, cool looking piece. Again, Australian, like a, I don't know, I guess a, a cornerstone of the Australian LPS trade. Twenty-four. There's a train. Twenty-four. It's a uh, an orange um, Yayamensis frog spawn. Also uh, an Australian coral. Train. Like see, when I hear a train, it like shuts my brain off. So I just, I can't focus. Um, yeah, so these guys are pretty uncommon, especially in this color. Uh, that's kind of why it's a little bit expensive. But if you're looking for kind of like a, a hard, to, hard to find, more on the rare side um, frog spawn LPS, this is definitely one to consider. Next one is also a Yaya Mensis. It's a little bit smaller, a little bit less expensive, so I'll give you a choice between the two if you're looking for something. They're not super fast growing compared to the Indonesian varieties. Uh, the Australian um, hammers, torches, frog spawn tend to be a lot more slow growing. Uh, just by the way that they grow, they don't send off buds at their base and just grow multiple heads really fast. They tend to um, uh, split the individual polyp. So if you can kind of see my hands here, they'll pinch off like that and then grow two new ones. So it takes a lot longer to do that. Next up is our purple and green hybrid hammer. So this is another Australian variety here. Um, the purple and green hybrid is basically the, uh, the tips that we're talking about. Um, they have that, that purple as well as that green, and it kind of almost looks like a like electrical sparks going on when the, when the two come together. It's a pretty cool, cool appearance. Yeah, I can hear you great talking over that train now. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have really high production value with sound effects. <laughs> Actually, speaking of sound effects, like somebody was asking at one point, like, can you play some music in the background? So in chat, let me know if you would like to hear music. I have to find royalty-free music, kind of like what I do with the rest of my videos, um, but it's certainly possible, I guess, maybe. Let's just move on, number 27. Okay, cap it whenever you like. I'll figure it out when the screen turns black. <laughs> um, the next one, which you will see at some point soon, is our uh, purple and green. It's 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 just another um, example of the of the previous coral. You know, at number fifty, I'll go over the rules again. So if anybody's got questions as to how to do um, like the live sale and stuff, we'll go over it at number fifty. So somebody hopefully will remind me to do that. <laughs> Okay, no music please, it's distracting. I agree. Like it's, it's hard enough for me to do this and DJ, so. so there's that. Okay, let me see, where was I? Number 27, okay. Purple and green hybrid hammer. Okay, next up, we've got number 28. So these, I believe, are Indonesian. They will grow much faster because they grow little buds at the base. You can probably even see some buds here. Um, and this guy has a kind of a unique coloration. It's kind of hard to find like uh, that kind of that pastel peach colored um, tip on these types of hammers. Usually they're green or purple. Make your own music out of trains. <laughs> Nice. All right. 29, another peach hammer. 
So if you guys missed out on the first one, you can try to grab the second one. It's a little smaller, but they grow quickly, like I mentioned. Uh, next up, number 30. So this is the first time I think that we've offered this particular coral. It's uh, one of like the more difficult to find rare guys. It's a free care pavona. Um, there's some really weird pavonas out there. And this is one of those guys. It's a gr like a purple base and fluorescent green uh, tips on each tentacle. Very cool. And sometimes that purple base is, turns almost like a magenta color. So it's definitely like a really curious piece. And it also encrusts. Uh, Pavona is called a cactus coral. And it's called a cactus coral because of, its, uh, of these plates that usually uh, form like a, like a vertical plate, not like a horizontal plate like you might see in a montipora or a chalice. Um, so in that sense, it's already strange, like the, the encrusting, but also like the, the coloration really sets it apart. So that's the only one we've got. Number 30, it's the free care. Moving on, 31 is our orange pavona. Again, does not form plates, but these guys form like these, um, these kind of knuckle-like uh, growths, I guess. And they start like, you know, uh, building off and, and forming like these multiple knuckles as the, as the colony grows. Uh, again, um, it almost looks like it can encrust, but it also, you know, it builds up as well. And each individual polyp looks kind of different than what you would normally uh, see on other types of pavona. So it's a pretty interesting piece. I believe this is Australian. Number 32, getting into some of our more rare guys here. Uh, this is the jack-o'-lantern Leptoceras. These are all uh, small pieces, but they've got a bunch of eyes. I would say that this guy has at least nine individual eyes. Um, now the jack-o'-lanterns, you'll, you'll see the distinction once I um, move on to the, nec to the next coral, but they have very, very, very small eyes. Um, and what separates this from like a golden Leptosiris is that um, they have like the, the bright yellowish green um, centers. So we've got three of those available at $75. Next, we only have one of these available, but it's, we just are gonna call it like a big eye Leptosiris. See the difference in, in the size going from one to the other, um, from going from like the jack-o'-lantern to this, it's like a much, much bigger eye. Uh, also, again, it also has that, um, that bright greenish yellow look to it. And moving on to number 34 is our golden. And we've got three of these guys available. And a little cameo from one of our fox faces. But yeah, you can see how like the, the golden guys, they tend to have large eyes as well, but it's harder to see because it, it's not color differentiated. And I, I say this in every broadcast, but I do like how um, how these guys look like they're almost made out of like 24 karat gold. It actually has that shimmering metallic appearance to it, which is really kind of uncommon in coral, obviously. Number 35, Cobalt Platygyra. As far as LPS goes, sometimes platygyra can be a little bit sensitive. Um, they are a maze brain. It's actually tip, it's technically a maze, uh, uh, like a, a brain worm coral or something like that. Maze worm, something like that. Um, and they tend to be, like I said, a little touchy. They can uh, just take a, a dive once. Um, once like the water chemistry gets thrown off of whack or something like that. But at the same time, once they've been in your system for a long time, we've probably had this guy for like six months, uh, they tend to, to really stabilize. Other types of corals like Symphilia, you might come across like outrageously, amazingly colored brain corals. Like they die within just weeks after getting uh, imported for whatever reason. I've never seen anybody really do well with Symphilia and we definitely don't. So. There are some of these like touchier types of brains out there, but again, it's also one of the cooler looking ones. 36.
Okay, so this is a bicolored platygyra. Slightly different um, arrangement of the polyps, but it has that really cool purple and green, um, purple and green look. It, the, the purple's practically black, and that's not just like our, our exposure being too dark. It's actually very, very, very dark in person. Somebody in chat just said, the fish was eating your head. <laughs> nice. All right. Going on, 37. And we're capping. Okay. We're capping. Okay. So, I don't know if you guys are boxing fans at all, but I kind of am. I'm like an MMA fan, and I'm a boxing fan. And Pacquiao Mayweather is going to be going on this evening at about like 11 p.m. Eastern. I don't know if any of you guys are looking forward to that, but that's like the fight. That's like the best boxing fight like in my entire life. And I'm old as hell. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. So I don't know. In, in chat, let me know who you think is going to win that fight. I'm, a, I'm kind of curious as to, as to what the coral folks think about boxing. Okay. Number 37, Blue Ridge. So Blue Ridge coral, we chalk it up as a soft coral. It may or may not be. It has a very leathery texture, um, almost like, it feels like what you would consider like a tendon or like a, um, like collagen-ish feel to it when you grab it. Um, they extend these polyps, but at the same time it's really common for them to um, to stay closed for a very 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 long time they build up like a waxy coat and then shed it off occasionally and I think that's a way that they manage um, algae that grows on them and they can sloth it off easier so they remain closed a lot but at other times they're completely furry to the point where you basically can't even see their structure Okay, and we have 10 of those guys available for cheap, or 20, no, 10 of those for $20. There, I can read. Moving along, number 38, way down, is our peach-eyed Achan Echinata. This may or, not, may, may or may not be an Achan Echinata. It's um, possible that this is a Rotunda Flora, now remember when I could say that I, I remember when I said that I could tell apart uh, Postulopora and Stylophora really easily. When it comes to Echinata versus Rotunda Flora, I have the hardest time. All the pictures that I see of these guys tend to be super different from one another, and I guess like depending on the geography where the Rotunda Flora is from, it can look more like an Echinata or more like a chalice even. So that kind of muddies the situation a little bit more. So I'm gonna call this one an Echinata. And actually, uh, Matthew, could you dial up the exposure so we can see the colors a little better? It's kind of dark. Yeah, that's a little better. So you can kind of see how like each individual eye has a little bit more going on with that, that, that peach coloration. Okay, next up. Again, this guy may or may not be an Echinata. It may be a Rotunda Flora. I don't really care, because it is incredible. So if you look carefully at each eye, it is um, almost has like a, a rainbow scalemia-like pattern to it. So the outer polyp has like this deep purple going on, and the inner part is like uh, every single uh, middle of the polyp is different. So it's kind of cool for that reason. Item number 40. This guy, I am sure, is an Aiken Echinata because that's kind of um, what most people are familiar with when it comes to um, these Echinatas is really it's going to come down to like um, a true rainbow, which is kind of like a combination of like purples, greens, and oranges or like the ones that are mostly orange, which kind of gets dubbed an orange crush. 
So we've got one of these guys available, and it's got a ton of polyps. So it's a pretty good deal for like 35 bucks. It probably has at least a dozen polyps, I'm gonna guess, just by looking at you know what I'm seeing on stream here. Next up, number 41, is our blood red Akan Bauer Banky. Bauer Bankies have much, much larger, flatter polyps than um, what people normally see on, um, on Akans. I'm guessing most people are very familiar with Akan Lord Hawensis's, which we'll have a couple on later. Um, but Bauer Bankies have polyps that are easily four times as big when they're full grown. And they tend to be a lot, a lot more robust. Um, they're way tougher, easier to frag, don't succumb to infection nearly as easily. Okay, Ronaldo, I can't pronounce your last name, I'm so sorry, um, asks, what camera is this? This is a Canon C100. It's their entry-level cinema series camera. Um, that's my other hobby, if you couldn't tell already. I like making videos. So um, I can kind of justify sort of spending like a ton of money on camera equipment, but I kind of take it to an extreme because I just like owning that type of stuff and playing with it. So it's a pretty serious little piece of kit, but it obviously it does kind of good. Now the camera that's pointed on me is just the webcam from my um, from my MacBook Pro, so that's that's nothing. But the actual one showing the corals is um, is a Canon C100. Okay, moving on. Number forty-two is a purple and green Akan Bauer Banky. The center. It's greenish, but it's almost yellow at times, depending on kind of like what kind of lighting you're, you're looking at it under. Um, very cool colony, once it gets larger especially. Um, anything that's kind of like has multiple colors in Akan Bauer Bankies tends to be a, a higher price point. A lot of times you see like a single colored Bauer Banky. So anytime that you see like striped ones or anything crazy, expect it to be harder to find generally. Okay, number 43, we're capping. And uh, what I'm hearing, uh, at least from, from chat, is that uh, Flux, so far nobody has said Mayweather. <laughs> Everybody's been Manny Pacquiao. And actually, I'm kind of hoping for Pacquiao also. Like, I'm not all... Uh, sweet science to the point where I can appreciate godlike defense for the whole fight. I, I have to see, you know, some, some offensive aptitude, and, and that's what Manny gives me. So I'm kind of hoping Manny Pacquiao wins. So back to Coral, guys. Number 43, it's the Rainbow Acan Lord Hawensis. There's a lot of different types of rainbows out there. This is obviously a very, very nice uh, example of one. I love these things. Uh, I wish I could like keep these guys around year-round. They tend to struggle for us in the summer just because of the, the, the wacky sun we get here. But right now, they're looking amazing. Somebody really should just buy these. They're awesome. They're, there's three of these available. They're between like three, four-ish polyps. There might be some babies in there someplace. But uh, if you do have some success with uh, Lords and you're looking for like that signature rainbow piece, these guys are pretty sweet. Um, so Sea Crab Run is asking, are the Bauer Bankies aggressive? Not necessarily, but I think that as a, a general overarching uh, thing when it comes to um, Acans, is you can't have them touch one another. Like an Acan Lord can brush up against an Acan Lord no problem. But if an Akan Lord brushes up against an Akan Echinata or a, Lo or a, or a Bauer Banky, you can pretty much guarantee that both of those corals are going to suffer severe burns from one another. So, um, yeah, they're aggressive to one another, like the different genus types. You definitely want to avoid that. Okay, let's move on. Number 44. It's a lime green Akan Lord. Now, the reason why um, I'm kind of optimistic for this colony, we, we picked these up not that long ago. So uh, we are probably haven't seen its final form, guys. Um, but it's, 
very likely that this guy is going to be more yellow than green. And anytime that you're talking about yellow Akan Lords, they're very cool. So I'm hoping that this guy turns more yellow over time. Um, and the lighting that we always kind of recommend for Akans, I tend to go more towards T5 than LED. Because under LEDs, they kind of take on some um, kind of more muted coloration. Whereas, uh, and they, they kind of looked, um, I don't know if drab is the right word, but it loses something. Whereas under T5, they, they just seem to radiate from the inside almost. So we're definitely growing these under some low light T5s and hoping for, for yellow. That's kind of fingers crossed yellow. Okay, next up, number 45 is our green, green pinwheel Akan. It's kind of got these purple spokes. Um, this guy is definitely going to stay more green. A little bit larger, uh, and there's two of these available. I'm like reading chat, and I just I do not understand this person's question. Hmm. I'm gonna let it go. <laughs> Number forty-six. Uh, it okay. Going back to being able to tell stuff apart. Um, um, actually, Matthew, uh, you'll need to dial up the exposure because that's really hard to see. It's kind of dark. Um, going back to, to being able to tell stuff apart, Akan Lords and Micromusas look really, really, really similar. And it's kind of strange, but when I look at, at these two, I can just see the differences like a mile away. Um, the, the polyps are smaller. It's almost like they behave differently. So we sprayed some water, uh, uh, some water. We sprayed some food into the water. And you can see how they even react to different foods. So, I mean, they're completely different uh, genera. So like one is an Acanthastria, one is a Micromusa. They're very, very far apart on the evolutionary tree. But um, they look so similar and they behave so similar, and the care requirements are practically dead on. One thing I guess is also different about a Micromusa is that they will change color dramatically depending on the light that they're under. So um, you kind of have to pay close attention to that. This guy here that's red and purple right now can turn like peach colored under different types of lighting, or even like a yellow. It could, he could pick up an additional color, so it'd be like three colors. So, um, yeah, expect whoever takes this home for it to change color. That's just kind of how it is. That's how these things behave. Next up, number 47, is another UFO Micromusa. It is actually the exact same as the other one that you saw before, but it's been kept under different lighting. So you can see it's almost like an orange versus um, some of the more reddish tones that you saw previously. And this one almost has like a yellow center going on. It's literally the same thing, genetically. Just different tanks, different colorations. Okay. 48. This is the first time we've had this in years. Probably at least six or seven years. I never, ever, ever go out of my way to buy these things. This is Galaxia, or Galaxy Coral. Um, it's a colonial LPS, let's call it. Uh, you can see how there's these individual uh, stalks. Very, very fast growing. The reason why people sometimes tend to avoid these guys um, is because they send out sweeper tentacles. They are actually legendary for their sweeper tentacles. They can send out ones that are about 12 inches away from the main body and just sting stuff all over the place. I don't think that it has a particularly uh, devastating sting compared to some other corals, but just the fact that it takes up that footprint and it, like the moment that it gets any kind of um, hint of another coral around it, out come the sweepers. So that's definitely something to worry about um, when picking something like this up and placing it in your tank. You want to give this guy at least six to ten inches, uh, you know, just to make sure you're giving it enough room. Um, anything else? 
other than that, it's like a really cool looking coral. It's you know, got bright yellow uh, polyps and everything. It fluoresces like crazy under actinic. So if you're looking for something that just shines like like a like a beacon in your tank, Galaxia will do that. It'll it'll hold up its end of the bargain in terms of aesthetics, but it might snipe something. So just throwing that out there at your own risk, people. Moving on, forty nine. Rastas, probably the most popular uh, of the zoas that we have. Um, we've got two at this size, where it's about six-ish polyps. Um, and you can probably get a little sneak peek of the next one, 50, which is also Rastas. Slightly smaller piece. Um, go ahead and move the camera, Matthew, to, to show them both together. A little bit smaller piece, a little less expensive but you can kind of see the two side by side. Um, and so there's multiples of each one. Cause like the last time that we had these up in our last live sale, I think they sold before I was done even talking about them. They like instantly got, got picked up. It was, about, it was like a hundred dollars for like nine polyps or something like that. But um, the reason I think that they're uncommon is that they don't get frequently imported. And when they do get imported, they die. Like they're very sensitive for some reason during that type of transit, but say what? Yeah. And um, when it comes time to uh, to try to find these, it can be tough unless you find an aquacultured source. So we actually got these from one of our customers that was trading in a colony. So there's that. Okay, it's number fifty, and I want to go talk about the rules. So let's see, pew. If you were late to uh, the broadcast um, and wonder what the heck is going on, uh, I kind of like to look at it as, uh, as two different shows. So you have the live show that's on, on YouTube, youtube.com slash title gardens, what you're seeing now. Um, and you're able to purchase the corals that you see on titlegardens.com. So on like the top left of the navigation, you can see um, a link for the live sale. You'll see this video embedded in there, and you'll see what's left of the corals, which should still be a lot. We're on the number 50, and I think there's over 150 total uh, that we have to cover. Um, they're all just numbered uh, with, with quantities and prices, so you don't really see them until we go over them as a part of the stream. Um, as you uh, purchase, and by the way, I'm sorry, this is only for... Um, the U.S. market. We don't export um, overseas or anything like that. So it's U.S. only, and, and I love you international guys, you know, big heart. But uh, unfortunately, the, the YouTube part is just going to be for chat for you guys and not for the purchasing of these corals. Um, so if you do want to purchase corals, the shipping rate, $39.99 flat rate, and it's free for over $250. Um, as you check out, just select the local pickup slash live sale that sets the shipping to zero. And once you're done shopping, you can add in that $39.99 uh, shipping module to get the, that overnight shipping. Um, and don't worry about you know combining the orders. We do that in the back end. We follow up with you and we set a uh, shipment date once uh, you're all set. Uh, and lastly, uh, you need to actually check out with the item to get it. It's not good enough just to put it into your shopping cart. Okay, them's the rules. I'll go over that again at item number 100. And we are now on item number 51, which is our Jack Frost Pallies. Um, they're inexpensive. They're fast growing. They kind of have like a, a bluish hue to them. Uh, you can now see the difference between um, Paleothoa and Zoas. The, the, the tentacles definitely look different, um, but the real main differentiator between the two is um, Paleothoa actually incorporate substrate into its flesh. So if you were to see like a cross section of one of these Paleothoa, you can actually see like sand incorporated in, where Zoas don't really do that. Structurally, they're just very different. And I, I know that um, it's very fashionable now, and I, we've done it. I'm not, I'm not passing judgment, but a lot of things that are called Paleothoa are just large zoanthids. But um, it just became a trend where any large zoa 
got that label slapped on it. Oh, it's a pally, even though it's really not a pally. Okay, 52 moving on. Ah, looks like we're, uh, we're capping. Okay, take a look at chat real quick while we do this. Puffer Mike says, let me know when you get some Fruit Loops in. I would love to get some Fruit Loops in. We basically no longer import those like ever because uh, again, it shares the same problem that uh, the um, Rastas have. They come in, we might find like a great, beautiful looking colony and then it just dies like within 48 hours. So all of our um, like Fruit Loops, all of our toucans, all our rastas, we have to source from other hobbyists, which is great because you know it supports aquaculture, it supports people growing this stuff at home, and we pay a pretty penny for some of this stuff. So like local people, if you wanna sell me rastas, I will buy them all day. If you wanna sell me some cool zoas, literally, we will buy them all day. So get growing. <laughs> So Nick Nelson is asking, are pallies toxic? Some of them. So uh, it, it's kind of hard to determine which ones have what's called palytoxin, which is a really, 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 really strong nerve agent. Um, but the ones that do um, are so poisonous that you probably won't make it to the phone to call 911 if you actually had a problem with it getting into your bloodstream. Um, so uh, there's something called LD50, which is like a, a measure of toxicity. I think LD50 means like lethal dose, 50%. So that means um, how much does it take to kill 50% of the number of samples that you gave it to? I think that's how that works. Um, the LD50 of palytoxin is measured in like nanograms. Like it's like literally the one of the most toxic things you can possibly find on Earth to get into your body. So. If you're worried about that sort of thing, dying, you might want to wear gloves. Having said that, we kind of don't, which is dumb. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. We're hypocrites. But if you're worried about that sort of thing, be careful. They do, sometimes. Uh, moving on, 53. Is a mellow yellow combo rod. It's like 99% mellow yellows. Um, there's like one other polyp on this particular piece that's like red, and I think he's on the back. So I just call it a combo. It's mostly mellow yellow. It's a very cool, uh, bright fluorescent uh, center, So and it's, it's super fast growing. And most zoas are, are challenging to feed. So that's kind of a, a thing when you want to get them to grow faster. This particular piece, though, is able to grab uh, food out of the water column really, really easily. And, um, and it works uh, if you want to just kind of feed the, the, just the heck out of it and to get it to grow faster. So it's got that going for it. Number 54, we've got some pink and golds. Now, in the past, we always referred to these things as pallies just because they're really, really big. However, I'm pretty confident that they're really just big zoas. Uh, these guys, they change color quite a lot depending on their lighting. Um, right now, they're a little bit more brown. They were under super duper duper dark. But I think that if we were to do another live show in a couple months here in like the middle of summer, you'll see these guys turn almost um, like a completely pink and yellow, uh, like a pink polyp with, with a bright yellow speckles. Okay, next up, 55. One of my favorite Zoas. It's our ultimate rainbows. These guys, like their face is like a combination of yellows, greens, and blues. And uh, you can see on that top polyp there, which is kind of uh, facing up, how it also has like, like the, the pinkish reds going on as well, depending on which angle. Um, the, the colony is in. So as it grows and you get like, you know, just multiple orientations of the polyp, you get different colors. A very, very, very cool piece. 
And sometimes people call this a pally, and you see how much smaller it is than the, uh, than the pink and golds next to it. But I really do believe that all of these guys are just Zoas. I haven't like done a cross-section or anything like that. I'm really not in a huge hurry to cut one of these guys in half. Next up, 56, the Fiji Hypercolors. Um, some of these have a really cool uh, coloration aspect that, that shows up kind of rarely, but they have um, multicolored tentacles. So right now, like what you're seeing is like all green, but sometimes newer growths of it have like green, yellow, orange, red, green, yellow, orange, red. And so it kind of has like this completely different um, uh, tentacle pattern, even though it's literally the same piece, because it's, it's, it's all growing from the same mat but it has that, um, that hyper-color look to it. And we don't have the quantity there, but it looks like we've got at least three or four of them. Three. three. Okay, Corey Victoria is asking, is it normal that my Kenya tree breaks off a piece of itself every once in a while? Yes, that's definitely par for the course. Kenya trees um, reproduce like crazy that way. We'll have some Kenya trees on, on later on, so we can talk about that more. But yeah, it's super fast growing and they drop off babies. Number 57 are some Laguna Zoas. I'll be perfectly honest, those look really, really, really good on stream. I was kind of skeptical when I saw them this morning. They were kind of, kind of dusky looking, but they look really good right now. Just out of curiosity, is the stream down? Are you guys able to see still? I'm still up, as far as I can tell. But I think another one of the computers here thinks that the stream is down. So um, I'll just like pause momentarily, let the stream catch up, possibly, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, so just let me know in chat if you can still see me. That'd be nice. Um, moving on, number 58 are some red people eaters. Might need to focus on one way in the back to actually see the face. But um, yeah, they've got like this really bright green mouth in the middle of a red polyp. Kind of a cool, kind of a cool piece. We've got four of those available. All right, chat says we're good. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay, 59. We've got some mellow yellows. Not the combos, these are a little bit smaller, a little bit less expensive than the, the previous mellow yellow that we had up. Um, he's got a little uh, feather duster. Some people don't like those feather dusters, so if you dip that in Coral RX, he'll go away. Because like those reproduce, and so sometimes like people you know, don't like how you know those guys just keep on cropping up. But I also have a copper band butterfly, and copper bands actually like to eat worms more than they like to eat aptasia. So um, having these things grow in our tank isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world because I can feed those little things to uh, the copper band, which loves it as a treat. So actually. Uh, Talking about copper bands just a moment, the biggest issue with keeping them is that they tend to starve. They, um, they have a very, very narrow uh, feeding range as far as like what things that they'll actually eat that are nutritious for them. So um, basically finding anything to feed them, you know, as they take care of your aptasia problem, because they absolutely will, uh, it's kind of important to, to kind of maintain their nutrition. So like these worms, for example, are a good source. Okay. And uh, in case you didn't realize, um, I have um, Robbie here responding to people in chat. So when you see Title Gardens responding to folks, that's Robbie. Matthew's behind the camera. And I'm uh, sitting at my desk getting, getting my mug shot. Right, 61. 60. How bad? 60. So these are the Green Bay Packers, um, so-called because they've got like the orange and green going on. 
It's been a while since we've had some of these for sale. Uh, it took us a while to grow them out during the winter. So Puffer Mike is asking, have you been able to feed your copper bands any frozen foods? Yes. Um, and that's actually important to note. Like, we've, uh, since the last time we've done a live broadcast, we've started to do uh, some of our own seafood. Like, um, we started to grab stuff like from a, a fish market that's uh, in downtown Akron here. Uh, they get like shipments in pretty much like every week and it's like super duper fresh seafood and I've got a meat grinder that I do all kinds of like fun stuff like make my own hamburgers and cat food and random stuff but it also makes really 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 good seafood for out here at the greenhouse and I've noticed that a lot of things corals and fish respond very differently to the, the, the stuff that we've been making fresh so um, yeah like a lot of the, the, the stuff that we've been grinding up has been like perfect for the copper band and he's been like munching down on all kinds of stuff and getting fat as a matter of fact okay number 61 we've got some leonardo's we generally have some of these on every live show they're very popular zoa it almost always sells but it's kind of got like these concentric rings purple skirt um, purple center blue mouth with that green halo next up number 62 is our pink plasma zoas now somebody really should hop on this because uh, we typically sell these for over fifty dollars on the website so it's, it's a pretty steep discount from what we normally uh, what we normally charge and it's one of the more unique looking because it's got that, that, uh, that bright pink paint splatter look on both its face and tentacles. And this, kind of like the Mellow Yellows, is a very easy to feed Zoa. Uh, so they tend to grow a lot faster because they're able to just to bring in that much more uh, nutrients for itself. Next up, 63. We've got some red marbled Zoas. So Zoas and Pallies, um, I always get asked often, like how fast do they grow? And the answer of course is it depends because oftentimes um, it takes a little while for the colony to start growing. Once it starts growing, it's fast, but certain colonies, like once you put it into your tank, it just has this lag where there's like maybe three months, six months at the worst, where it just doesn't do anything. But then once it, um, once it finds its home, I guess, it takes off and it's very, very fast to, to grow additional heads. Um, moving on, 64. Got the double rainbow zoa, so you can see like the, the double um, arches forming there. And it's also one of my favorite internet memes. Um, the other question I get asked about Zoas and Pallies is like, are they easy to keep? And I'll say yes with an asterisk. Um, they are easy in the sense of water chemistry and tank parameters, lighting and flow and whatnot. They tend to, they tend to like higher flow, medium light, but they can't accept higher light. The biggest issue, though, is that they succumb to a lot of really weird diseases, like uh, like pox. There's weird parasites. There's flatworms. There's nudibranch. There's spiders. There's all kinds of things that like to prey on these things. And you've probably seen uh, swimming around in our tank here some fox faces. Once fox faces get larger. If we were to take like a tray of zoas and just bring it in and just dunk it into that guy's tank, they don't usually eat corals at all. But like the novelty of new zoanthids, they eat them. It's the strangest thing, but they'll eat like newly introduced zoas. So I mean, like, why? Why is that? Why zoas? But they tend to get picked on by a lot of things, and so that kind of makes them more challenging. Next up, 65, some Lucifer Zoa. So if you're looking for some really cool purple and reds, this is a, a nice example. It's got a nice bright green mouth as well. 
And I like these guys and the, the Darth Mauls is if you're looking for something something red. These are a lot less expensive. Um, and I think they're actually everybody's cool. It's, it doesn't have that, that that paint splatter pattern, but it's got like the the rings going on, which is always neat. Okay. Bert Christopher is asking, any scolies by chance in the live still today? Uh, I think that there's one that's going to show up later. It's not going to be for a while, um, but we also have an account affiliate, which we also almost never sell on, on live streams. They sell all the time on the website, but on live stream, like, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've been kind of gearing it up a little bit more high end in this one. That's why like the price point is a little bit higher. Our first few, a lot of it was um, kind of some more entry level stuff that we we're just like looking to clear out. And we had some $1 stuff just to give it away. <laughs> it's actually more expensive for us to pack it and ship it than it is to sell it for a dollar. But we were just, you know, getting the word out there that we're doing live sales. There are definitely some higher end things in this particular live sale. And we're gonna get to that towards the past midway point, two thirds of the way in, you'll see some really, really cool. Well, you're, you're gonna see cool stuff anyway, but you're gonna see expensive cool stuff, I should say. All right, moving on. Got 66, some eagle eye zoas. And yes, I see a little Aptasia there. Before we ship it out, we have the the uh, the copper band pick off all that stuff. So no worries. There's a little tiny microscopic Aptasia there. I apologize. We have 5,000 gallons here. We have Aptasia. Um, very 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 common coloration, but very popular still. <clears throat> So John is saying the sound isn't working for me. Can you guys still hear me? So in, in, uh, in chat, let me know. Okay, moving on. We've got item number 67, which is our purple death paleothelas. Yeah, John, I think that might just be your sound. Might want to restart the browser, check your audio, see if you got something plugged in. Looks like everybody else is good, maybe. Purple deaths are really cool. Like uh, purple deaths and nuclear greens are, are uh, like smaller uh, paleothoa. Um, they've been popular for ages. Uh, un under different lighting, sometimes we get like a, a cobalt blue tentacle set. Uh, whereas this one is tend to be more purple on purple. A different lighting is gonna give you that, that, that look. And I kind of prefer that look a little bit more. You can kind of see it, excuse me, on, the, uh, on that small polyp on the side, um, where it's a little bit more bluish rather than purple on purple. Okay, 68. Will take some time to get because I think uh, we have to do the big move. Okay. So I was gonna like wait till about 100 to do the rules again, but I may as well do it now because I'm gonna have some time. Uh, 68, all right. So here are the rules again. Um, you're watching us on, on, on live on YouTube. Okay, so it's 4.13 p.m. on May 2nd. If it is not that date and time where you're at, um, you are not watching us live. You're watching the rebroadcast. So um, if it's just like a few days afterwards, you can still probably participate in, in the sale because there's probably going to be some items left over. Uh, but you won't be able to chat with us live. So there is that. Um, I kind of like having the two windows open where you have uh, yeah. the stream available on YouTube, youtube.com slash titlegardens, as well as our website, titlegardens.com. I think it's slash coral slash live sale, live hyphen sale dot HTML. Um, you can navigate to that. It's on the top left of the screen. You can see a little link for the live sale. And you'll see like an embed of the video. You'll see like all the different, uh, you know, shipping, I all the different corals as well as like the shipping option. Speaking of shipping, it's $39.99 flat and it's free for orders over $250. So, um, you know, as you're ch uh, picking and choosing some stuff, uh, you'll want to check out because that's really the only way to reserve that item. Um, you know, just having it in your shopping cart really doesn't do anything. Um, and 
select local pickup live sale as the shipping option until you're done shopping and just make sure that like you do have the $39.99 in there um, either by um, you know, selecting like the flat rate or adding it in as an item itself. I'll leave you to those your own devices on that. Um, and you know we'll, we'll get in contact with you and figure out uh, a shipment date. Okay, what number were we on? You're on 68. 68. Okay, so 68, we're, uh, we're kind of heading into soft coral land now. It's a blue and green sympodium. This is a very, very, very fast growing, um, it's, it's got tiny polyps for a soft coral. Uh, it kind of grows as a mat. The mat itself is blue, which is kind of neat. Um, and as uh, the tentacles come out, they turn from like a blue color from the middle and they radiate out green. Kind of a cool piece. Will you sell one of your copper bands that are eating frozen food? Unfortunately, no, I will not because we have literally one <laughs> and we need it here. Actually, we don't sell fish. Like, um, and and I, I've been thinking about doing fish for like a really long time, but you have to understand that doing fish versus doing coral, they're completely different businesses. Um, and when it comes to doing fish, that's just not something that we do well right now. So we're kind of sticking with what we do well, but I've got some ideas on how it would be neat to do um, like a fish-based system. But every single time I revisit that idea, it comes back to the fact that I basically need another building that's completely different than the one that I have. So unfortunately, that's, that's a thing. Uh, sea Crab Run, 67 was a pally, right? That is correct, it was a Purple Death pally fella. Okay. Moving on, number 69 is Pulsing Xenia. This is a, the Red Sea variety. It's not from the Red Sea, I, I don't think. <laughs> I think that was just a name that got, got picked up over the years. But uh, people uh, knock this coral all the time for being like a, a noob coral and being like so beginner and it being a weed and taking over your tank. If you are just like a home hobbyist and want to uh, just to have something growing that subsidizes your hobby, something like this could easily do that. Um, we sell more pulsing xenia for a good profit than pretty much any other coral that we have. So we might have like a $600 scoli or a $600 acanthophilia or something like that. And the money that we make on Xenia in a week compared to selling one of those, it's not even close. Like the Xenia tramples all over it. Like as, as, as much heat as this coral gets, people still want it. And it's the easiest thing to grow. It really is. I mean, the, the people that, that have this thing grow like a weed, you know what I'm talking about. It's super fast growing most of the time. That or it's just gonna like fizzle and die. But for those that are successful, you could probably get this to subsidize your hobby. It's, it's a good grower. Okay, moving along to number 70, we've got our Kenya trees. Uh, we were talking about the, these a bit earlier. Again, talking about stuff that grows super fast. This doesn't sell quite as, um, as frequently as Xenia. I mean, rarely what does really, but uh, it, grows in rampant speed. So if you are looking for something to take up space in a soft coral dominated tank, uh, Kenya trees going to be high on that list. Next up, it's been a while, but we finally have Recordia again. Um, I would love to propagate Recordia like crazy. And I can't do it because it sells too fast for us. Even when we set it aside and say, okay, we're going to set these guys aside, somebody always manages to buy it from us. <laughs> we almost never have them on, on the website. People always just manage to take them from us somehow. So um, we were kind of lucky enough to, to get uh, an order in from our importer. And then so he brought it to our attention. But we got a bunch of it. So we've got some green Florida Recordia here. Next, we've got 
blue Florida Recordia. And spoiler, you can probably see what the next coral is going to be. Um, so Recordia Florida, I like a lot because you can propagate them easily. Even though we don't do it successfully, that doesn't mean you can't. Um, you can cut them very easily. They heal. You can wait and they just, uh, they just multiply on their own. Um, they don't do longitudinal, uh, wait, they don't do uh, pedal laceration, P-E-D-A-L as in foot. Um, a lot of other mushrooms, they scoot along and they leave behind bits of their foot. These guys don't really do that. They do that whole pinch thing. It's, I think it's called long, longitudinal fission where they kind of like pinch off and grow two mouths. So once you start seeing your, um, your recordia grow additional mouths, they're probably gonna be starting to split. Next up, there's the uh, orange Recordia Florida. Now I do kind of have a story about uh, Recordia Florida. Um, I'm always looking for like new colors and I've stopped trying to classify other colors of them. Like some people like, oh, there's, a, there's purple Recordia Florida. There's yellow Recordia Florida. See, it depends on lighting. I once bought uh, a Recordia Florida from somebody else's aquarium that was growing it under like, uh, at, this, at the time, like VHO fluorescence. And when I took it home, sure enough, it was completely different. Like my blue ones were more teal, whereas this one was like vibrant purple. And within like a couple of months, that vibrant purple turned into the exact same teal that I had. And so I have a feeling that a lot of what you see in terms of variation in color it's going to be like lighting and climate differences and they all kind of gravitate to, to whatever it was going to be in your tank. So I kind of clumped them just into these three. It's like it's green, it's blue, it's orange. There might be some differences, but it's not, not much as many as you might think. Okay, moving on. This is a tiny, itty bitty, what? Recordia Yuma. I hope I got those, my overlays correct. I might not have. Um, so this is a Yuma. Uh, you can kind of see the difference already. So normally Yumas are much larger than the Floridas. So like I said, this guy is very, very, very small, um, just as uh, a specimen. But cool blue base, cool orange tips. But you see the mouth, how it has like a cluster of small little uh, little dot tentacles that's different than um, the Recordia Florida that tends to have um, a very clean area like a an open space around its mouth um, also the, uh, the the tentacles themselves are a little bit more irregularly uh, spaced so you have like big ones and little ones where it's more uniform on a Florida obviously these are Pacific compared to the Caribbean uh, Recordia Florida and they tend to be a little bit more sensitive, but this one has been in our system for easily over a year, and it's rock solid. Moving along, we've got a nice uh, big orange Rodactus. Rodactuses come in many sizes and shapes. There's like a lot of, um, I guess like morphologic variation when it comes to um, Rodactuses. Some are like furry, which we'll see later. Um, some stay small and tight. Others get giant. And I mean by giant, I mean like a 12 inch pizza. And um, the, the giant 12 inch pizza guys, we've got one in here someplace that's like pizza sized. And those you have to worry about because they're, they're usually the elephant ear variety. You might hear them described as that. They actually put like some chemical in the water that sedates fish. So fish fall asleep. They actually go to sleep when they come into contact with this, um, with this chemical in the water. And they fall into the middle of these, um, these mushrooms. And the mushroom just closes on these sleeping fish and just gobbles them up alive. So yeah, like huge elephant ears can do that. Pretty good at it actually. But yeah, like I said, very large variation when it comes to these Rodactus. This maximum size on, on the orange that you're seeing here is about two inches, I would say. Three inches at the most, maybe. Okay, next up. We've got a Discosoma. Discosoma are arguably the easiest to keep, and these guys do uh, propagate by pedal laceration. 
So they're in constant motion and leave behind bits of themselves, and those little bits turn into full mushrooms over time. I like this guy just because he's got those cool little, uh, like the, the different colored spots and uh, off of the base. There might even be babies already on these plugs. I haven't really checked. So you might be getting a couple, maybe one or two. Okay, moving along. Uh, I suck at overlays, I'm sorry. 77, it's the red spotted. And I do see a little baby there, so this guy should even be more expensive than 20 bucks, but whoever gets it first gets it. I want to check chat real fast, okay. I've noticed that when it comes to Discosoma, they tend to expand more under low flow and low light. So if you're kind of like struggling with them looking kind of tight, um, that's something that I would consider looking into is like, uh, is, you know, what kind of flow and what kind of light do you have them under? Because they tend to contract quite a lot. Tony Nguyen asks, oh, I, I hope I said that right. I can never, Nguyen? It's like the most common like Vietnamese last name and I can't pronounce it. Um, do you have any clams today? Unfortunately, no. We rarely have clams. They tend to, to die on us a lot unfortunately. But when we do have clams, you'll know, because we get some spectacular clams in when we do get them in. Okay. 78 is our green hairy mushroom. This is a Rhodactus. So you can see just how different it is. I mean, it practically has like anchor-shaped uh, tentacle tips compared to the orange one that you saw before. Okay, moving along. Purple spotted mushroom. It's more like a purple on purple compared to the other one. Uh, one thing that you may or may not know about mushrooms like this, because nobody really does this, is you can feed them super easily. All you have to do is turn off your pumps and make sure like a sinking pellet of food lands on them and you'd be surprised at how quickly these things can consume pellets assuming that a fish doesn't come by and snipe the food, but they're, um, they're really capable of it. So um, you can check out on um, our YouTube channel. We did uh, a thing on different mushrooms, and on one of those, we actually do time-lapse videos showing like all these different types of, uh, of mushrooms eating pellets. Um, so definitely worth taking a look at that. It might even be in our um, one of our food videos, probably talking about like, um, one of our LPS pellets or like a sustainable aquatics LPS pellet. But uh, yeah, you can absolutely do it. We don't make a habit of doing it, but um, it's probably something that we, c we should be doing long term because that would definitely get it to grow faster. Number 80, a blue speckled mushroom. Yeah, these guys are pretty slick because they've got like uh, that, that, the, the little dots as well as like the larger marbled streaks. So someone's asking, will feeding them make them more likely to eat your livestock? No, I doubt it. I mean, if like an elephant ear is already putting in chemicals to knock out your fish, it was gonna do that before anyway. Number 81, the f it's a fuchsia discosoma. I wish this looked a little different than it does on stream because in person it's actually a lot more vibrant of a, of a pink fuchsia-ish color. Um, it's definitely like a bit of a showstopper and also like the, it's got these mossy green tentacles. Uh, very, very distinct looking uh, discosoma. It's like the first time I've ever seen it was in this last shipment that we got. Okay. Number 82, got a purple and green Rhodactus. The noticeable thing about this is that it actually has like a, has a different colored rim. A lot of times um, these Rhodactuses, they don't have like a, a different skirt, but this one does. We're actually making halfway decent time. Then I realized that we started an hour early. <laughs> so. 
I'll try to pick up the pace here. Uh, 83. Orange Redactus. This, this guy, um, again, is one of those, he's different than the previous Orange Redactus that we had in that this one is very, very tight. It doesn't have, it's more like a, of a, like a Tonga bullseye looking one than the previous um, orange. And uh, I believe this one has a lighter colored skirt. EJ DeAndre asks, can I propagate these mushrooms? Yes, you can cut them. The trick is getting them to reattach to something else. So when I do uh, cut them, I make sure that they're still stuck on something. Um, because getting them to stick after the fact is really challenging. So make sure that they're still stuck on a piece of substrate and then glue that substrate onto a larger piece. But as far as cutting them, it is pretty easy to do. All right, moving on, 84. This is a red discosoma. This guy's just like really sweet. It's like bright red with like pink speckles. And there's two of them on this plug. So somebody's getting the bonus. Cause that normally, if you were to come to the greenhouse and buy that, that would be about $45. So take that for what it's worth. Mr. Silent 937, first of the month, not a good time when people have bills to pay. Damn you, Than. It's also refund season. It's tax refunds. Y'all should be getting fatty checks from the IRS. <laughs> Assuming you guys are American and pay taxes. Two big assumptions of mine. All right. Uh, 85. We've got a, a red and green Rodactus. We've got tons of mushrooms on this live sale, man. Got, got tons, of, tons of value. 86. Oh, oh, we're, we're at the end? Okay, we've got a cap. Oh, my refund was February 15th. Yeah, I got a pretty sweet refund this time too. My first time, usually I'm like paying four figures come tax time. So tax time usually isn't good for me. Catching up on chat here. Mr. Silent, I'm only an hour from you. I'm in Dayton, Ohio. You're about an hour and a half to two hours, I'd say. Yeah, but you should come visit. Like, it's, it's hard to show all the stuff that we actually have here, whether it be on a live sale, whether it be on um, our web, like our, our website, we're lucky to have 200 corals to 250. That's, that's like really good for us. Whereas like in person, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of items. So like, this is really the, the best that we've been able to do online. It's like these live shows where we're able to go like one item to the other, just straight down the line. Yeah, this is probably like double what we normally have on the website. So like you guys take advantage of it. It's, uh, it's a lot better <laughs> than it used to be. Okay, so what we're on, 86 here? Yes, that's, so this is the purple uh, Tonga bullseye. Um, this Rodactus used to be so incredibly rare. I think that we got our original one, um, boy, this must have been over 10 years ago. And it was, I think, like close to $50 per pod. And we've been propagating it for like years. All right, 87, let's move on. A sapphire blue discosoma. What I always kind of liked about discosomas in general, and you'll see this, and I think there's a couple others that, that have this, but when um, they have these like kind of creases on them, they get really fluorescent. So you can just see where it's bending there, uh, how uh, it's picking up all that light, all that, all that those teal highlights. Um, sometimes these are, these are called metallic discosomas because of that, because of, they get this sheen to them. So this guy's like a bluish purple one, but it has like those, those highlighter uh, uh, teal highlights, highlighter highlights. English uh, speaks it, 80, 88, 88. Green striped discosoma.
Anthony Debson, are you showing any hard corals today? I think you might have missed like the first 75-ish. We showed a ton of stonies. Um, we are going to be getting into stonies real soon here. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, like we're finishing up on our, on our um, mushrooms. Yeah, we've got a few more of those to go. But then we're going to hit a few soft corals, it appears. And then we're going to hit stony corals really hard. Really hard. So I hope you guys like Montipora in particular. <laughs> got a lot of Montipora. All right. Uh, 89. Let's breeze through the rest of these, uh, these mash rooms. Got a green marbled. It's kind of cool because it's in addition to like the, this, this mossy green base with like the blue highlights, it's got like practically a pink purplish rim. All right, 90 is our red marbled. Easily one of the coolest mushrooms that we have. I wish we had more of these. I think we only have like about five or six of these things total in our whole place. Yeah, love these things. So sea crab run, I hate blindly buying, so I always what you see is what you get, but this is a lot more fun. Um, well, in these single item ones, you are seeing what you see is what you get. So there is that. But if it's like, you know, 5X, trust me, you'll, you'll have a hard time distinguishing the first one from the second one from the third one. Um, the other thing about what you see is what you get is like people don't really realize this, but we don't buy coral sight unseen. Like we literally hand pick in person every single coral we buy. So we're never surprised by like what shows up in the mail, like ever. So um, yeah, that's, it's nice, definitely nice to be selective. Number 91 is our lava lamp. Discosoma. This is one of the, the higher price point guys, but it also has a baby. So you're lucky on that. Usually this would sell for close to $50 on our site without the baby. Uh, Red Wing, sorry, we don't ship to Canada. Um, you know, import export is really messy and it's really, really, really expensive. So like, it's not economical for us to do it unless we're talking like five figures. I know, it's super, super pricey. Uh, number 92. It's actually a combo. Not meant to be, but it is. So it's supposed to be just for the floor, for the orange um, discosoma that has that metallic sheen to it, but it has a little hitchhiker uh, rhodactus. So you kind of get both. Mr. Silent, 937, is that lava lamp hard to take care of? No, it's just uh, pretty much the same as any other disc discosoma. Low flow, low light. You can feed it if you like. Pretty easy, really hardy. 93. We've got uh, 93 and 94 are two different types of um, green star polyp. So you can go ahead and get, get both of them in, in frame so we can see them together. You can see the, the one is like the neon green and the other, number 94, we call it just called the, the big eye because they have a large, large central um, polyp which you can, or mouth, I should say, on the polyp. Very easily distinguished from one another. Now, the, the key that I've seen to, do, to doing well with green star polyps is to give them plenty of flow. And I know that a lot of folks might say, oh, green star polyps are a weed, they're easy to keep. I've killed so much of this stuff, it's not even funny. I don't think, it's that, I don't think they're that easy. And I think it was because they were in too low flow. 95. Yellow-tipped clove polyps. I love cloves. Um, they're hard for us to photograph because whenever we move these guys into the photography tank, they take like three days to reopen. And by that time we've given up and we don't bother shooting the photo. So it's actually way easier on a live sale for us to show these guys um, living and doing well than it is because they're, they're, they're like the least photogenic corals too, for whatever reason. But 
they're it's they're amazing like those yellow tips are fluorescent so if you put them under like an led actinic they're bright bright highlighter yellow it's, it's a it's a great coral Uh, Mr. Silent, wife loves Recordia. Are there any of those in there? Uh, you missed like a ton of them. Uh, they were at the start of our mushroom section, so maybe like seven. It starts in the seventies. Isan Adib, can you give me a shout out? There you go. You got a shout out last time too, didn't you? And last live sale. <laughs> All right. I, actually, Isan, tell your friends about this stream. Get more people watching the stream. So that's how you can pay me back for that shout out. <laughs> okay, um, moving on, 96, we have some pipe organ. Uh, pipe organ coral is called such because they uh, have what looks like a skeleton that's red and um, forms like what looks like this pipe organ structure. And, you know, and from that emerges like these, these pinkish white polyps. I don't really know what the great success to keeping these is. I think a lot of people do better with them than I do because they kind of get neglected in my system. But they're not that difficult to keep. They do pretty well. Dav MRLS, Dav Merles, granddaughter Anissa says, hi, fan. Hi, granddaughter Anissa. OK, moving on, 97. We're back into stony coral. So whoever was looking for stonies, here we are. And we are in our long set of Montes. So I'm just gonna throw this out there. If you like Montipora, buckle up. There's gonna be a lot of Montes on the way. So Mystic Sunset, they're uh, uh, red base, blue polyp, or yeah, blue polyps, but it's a little bit more to that. If you look really, really extra carefully, the polyps themselves are like half blue. And the other half is like purple. So it almost looks like this, the, the, the lighter side is like a, almost like an eyelash. So it's a very distinctive uh, polyp coloration. Moving on, 98 is the regular sunset. Cool thing about sunsets is that their base can kind of fluctuate color. So uh, sometimes it's more uh, yellow, sometimes more orange. So the larger the colony gets, you get like a very, very different color, almost like a rainbow base to it. Um, Montipora, just in the, in the realm of SPS, I guess are closer to um, Acropora than most of the others. So they're going to really like a lot more light typically than uh, many of the other corals. Uh, they have a wide range of of growth patterns that you're going to see. Some that are encrusting, some of them that are plating, some of them that are branching, uh, and some and they have different textures even amongst the encrusting varieties. So you're going to see a, a good cross section. Next is our is our cap. <laughs> you're going to see a rainbow shortly. You know what? Uh, we're close to 100. We'll just do the rules while we move along. Um, please watch us on youtube.com. You can uh, participate with the chat through there, assuming that uh, we're talking about uh, you watching the actual live cast. It's 4.43 p.m. on Eastern time, uh, May 2nd. If you're watching it after that, it's a rebroadcast. There's no point in, in chatting with us live. But um, you can still uh, you know, order corals, and assuming that you're uh, stateside, uh, you can go to the website, titlegardens.com, Go to the live sale section and you'll see both this broadcast as well as our entire inventory of our remaining live sale items. I'm sure many have been picked up by now. Um, the shipping is $39.99. Uh, it's free over $250. Please select local pickup until you're done shopping. And if you're under $250, please add in the $39.99. Um, you have to reserve the item by actually checking out. So if you have to check out five times to get five corals, that's how it is. Some people just say, you know what, I'm just going to buy these three, they, and they pick up all three, and it's no problem. But if somebody happens to, to, to get one of those before you're able to check out, they would get it. So be mindful of that. Uh, that's all for that. <clears throat> so number 99 is the Rainbow Monty. Um, 
This particular Rainbow Monty is a little bit less rainbowy than I'm used to seeing, but I think it's just a lighting thing. Um, they like a ton of light, and um, it's not uncommon at all to see them pick up reds, yellows, greens, purples, all in the same, um, same rock. And if you check out some of our past broadcasts, you can see some other examples. If you check out our website to see some past uh, rainbow monties that have sold, there's some really, really, really dazzling ones. You'll just want to make sure that once it gets into your tank, it gets a lot of light. <clears throat> okay, number 100. We're two-thirds of the way through. Um, the blue and gold monty. Now, there's five of these available. I remember the last time that we sold these, uh, it sold like instantaneously and a whole bunch of people were, were asking me about this later. So now we have five available. We have four available. <laughs> Lies. Okay. 101. Scarlet Montipora. So both uh, the previous one, the, the blue and gold, I believe that might be a plating one. This guy, too, I believe is plating, even though they look on their face kind of more encrusting. Next. We've got our purple sand dollars. These guys are definitely an encrusting variety. Uh, and they're kind of cool because their their polyps are actually spaced out a little bit further than what you might see in other Monty, so they kind of have a distinctive uh, um, a distinctive look to them. Number one hundred was it was hundred plating? Uh, it might be, yeah, uh, Gene. Hundred might be plating. It's either encrusting or might or, or plating. It's kind of hard to tell. Espresso, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm addicted to espresso, um, and I bought like this espresso machine in my house, and I give uh, espresso, like, I, I like roast my own beans and stuff. So it's like crazy strong, and it's crazy intense and flavorful, and I give it to my employees, and we go crazy. Like, uh, just the amount of work that we get done, it's like we're uh, hopped up on cocaine or something. So totally intentional. <laughs> yeah, we're in love with the cocoa. All right, so 103. <clears throat> uh, we've got a neon green encrusting. There's been some internal debate as to whether this is even a Montipora at all. It's, it behaves very strangely in that uh, it has like sweeper tentacles sometimes. It doesn't, I mean, you can actually see like towards the bottom of this, po uh, of this uh, frag plug even, you can see how like the tentacles are longer. Like it's practically ready to send out sweepers again. Very, very curious behavior. Yeah, I'm a coffee snob. You don't even understand. Like I was like uh, making like French press coffee and then one day I had this conversation with one of my friends who like works in Italy. He does like a, like a touring company in Italy and he's talking about how like Italy ruined him for for coffee because they they make like really good espresso and espresso like just wrecks regular coffee and just one day I was drinking my French press and it's just like it just wasn't good enough one day so I had to like you know to, to do all this research on how to like pull the perfect espresso shot and long story short yeah coffee snob okay moving along Montepora people I have to stay focused <laughs> Uh, Montipora orangi. Uh, this is still one of the more rare varieties of Montipora. It's a has a an orange on orange look, but it's also like super smooth. Like the skin is like super smooth and creamy looking. So once uh, these guys get to like a large size, it like it sticks out like a sore thumb, and it's very very bright. <clears throat> All right, 105, still in Monty land, is our purple plating. So again, if you're looking for plating, we got a, a few more of these coming up. Pretty much if you're looking for almost any type of plating, chances are you might see it in, in this live sale. We've got so many Montys left to go. We've got like 19 or 20 total. Uh, next up, 106, is our green plating. 
This is a more muted green, um, and my hope is that it develops a purple rim. I don't know if it will or not, but that's kind of my hope. Because like the, the ones that develop purple rims are almost never bright green. They're usually like a more of a muted green. Also, like the, the texture on those is like a, a lot more rough than on some of the other platers. So my thought is that it probably will. Okay, so let's see. Anthony Debson, my Sunset Monty made a tree-like formation and attacked my Australian bubble coral. Is this natural? Weird, but I suppose it could happen. I haven't really seen mine do anything quite like that. And I'm surprised that it survived the bubble. I would expect that the bubble would have beaten the Monty back. Okay, um, number 107 is the neon green plating. So you can see the difference between that, that, that muted green versus the neon green. I like this neon green a lot. It sticks out like a sore thumb, but uh, it's not going to develop like a different rim of any other type, I don't think. 108. This was also a, a super duper popular one the last time we had it on the live sale. It's a plating uh, purple that's got yellow eyes. And so we've got two of those available. It's all we could find that was the consistent size, unfortunately. Okay, next up, 109, is our deep purple plating. So if you're wondering why the lighting seems to change a lot, we're actually, you know, we are in a greenhouse still. This isn't as much of a studio as you might think. Um, so like when the sun like goes away, it changes the lighting dramatically as to what you're seeing. So right now you're seeing mostly um, T5. We're running um, probably some combination of Aku Blue Special and Blue Plus ATI bulbs, if you're familiar with those. We're th that are Coral Plus, Blue Plus, maybe. Okay, 110. We've got the white eyed plating, so it's kind of a mossy green with white eyes. What are the little feather-like protrusions on some of the Montes? Some of them actually have like barnacles living in them. Some of them are feather dusters, but, but uh, I know that one, I think the one with um, the yellow eyes actually has like little barnacles in it. Okay, 111 is the chili pepper Montipora. This guy I think is plating. I haven't seen a large colony of it, so I'm not quite 100% sure. So in chat, um, if I'm wrong on that, I mean, like a chili pepper Monty is like a known quantity. It's like it's on the web. I didn't like make up that name myself. So it's whatever that is, I expect. Um, number 112. It's a Montiport Indata. Indatas are really cool because I like their, their, their uh, structure that the texture uh, on the surface is very different than all the other Montes. Colors are pretty cool too. It's got a lot of purples and, um, and fuchsias and stuff like that going on. Next up, number 113, we have an orange plating Monty. Very, very, very fast growing guy. It's obviously very popular as well. Next up, 114, is the purple spiky. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, many of these things have very uh, interesting, uh, like, surface type uh, textures. And, like, the, the spiky Montes are kind of interesting because they develop these nubs. And so the polyps are kind of in the valleys. And so it kind of has, like, this, this, this brown, tannish surface, but then, like, the polyps themselves are, like, this bright purple. Next is 115, the green Digi. So you, you probably are well aware that Montipora can have branching colonies as well. For whatever reason, we only have like a few different types of branching um, and we have mostly encrusting and plating. 116, 
is the red plating Montipora. This is very similar to the um, to the orange plating, but you can you can see that it is uh, like a, a, a deeper coloration. Okay. Next, 117, a yellow scroll. So we decided to, to position these guys uh, close to the plating Montipora because a lot of times people might be looking for a plating coral that's not necessarily as challenging as an SPS. And so scroll corals like really fit the bill. They have practically the same uh, growth pattern, but um, they have far less requirements in terms of lighting, in terms of flow, in terms of water uh, stability. So yeah, if you're looking to get into like a mixed reef but just don't want to really go all SPS crazy, um, this might be a good option for you. Next up, another type of scroll. Uh, it's, it has a purple base with yellow polyps versus more of a yellow on yellow. Okay, 119. We'll get there in a sec. <laughs> oh, stretch out here. Almost five o'clock. So we've been at this for two hours, you guys. And we have like a lot more corals to go. <laughs> All right, 119 is uh, probably the biggest ticket item that's going to be on this live sale. It's our rainbow acanthophilia. Um, somebody should grab this for real because it's really close to probably what we paid for it. And usually rainbow acanthophilias like this are in the 400 range. Um, they are one of my favorite corals. I don't have a favorite coral. People always ask me, like, what's your favorite coral? I don't have one. But um, I, th there's a lot th to like about acanthophilia. So one, obviously, is that they look incredible. Uh, you know, they, they oftentimes have, like, crazy uh, patterns. So this one has, like, the, the different multicolored streaks going on. Um, they can grow to really impressive sizes. Like, the largest one that we've ever had was probably, like, you know, close to... 10 inches across when it's fully expanded. Um, uh, no, that's good. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that people don't realize about acanthophilia, because they're, they're usually like, people get gun shy whenever like a coral is over $200 because that's, that's a lot of money to sink into a coral. But acanthophilia are one of the most bulletproof LPS you can find. Like, they just survive anything you can practically keep it in a bucket of salt water and like people don't really realize that they assume that everything that's going to be that expensive might be a little bit fragile but no they are like they're like the tanks of the lps world they're they're hardier than any other brain coral that i can that i can think of off the top of my head so like how big is it this guy's probably like what three and a half to four inches yeah and, and he's still not even fully extended right now like once like he gets fed or, or swells, he could probably add like an inch or two in size. Yeah, he could be about six inches across. Okay, so, yeah, so people were asking for, uh, for some higher end stuff. Here's some higher end stuff. All right, we've got a ruby scully. Um, a nice deep red color on this guy. The reason why he's discounted down to 75 is he has that little bit of a patch where he took some damage at one point. And since then, we've, we've taken him off the website. But you can just see by like, you know, how grown over that is that it's like not an issue any longer. So, but people still like, you know, the overall circle shape of Scolies. So uh, he's a little bit discounted for that reason. All right, next up, we've got some candy canes. This one we've, we've kind of dubbed our red candy cane. I think it's a little bit more, um, more of like a muted cobalt, but 
Um, then again, like once I see a cobalt that's like really, really, really cobalt teal-ish looking, whereas this one stays more, more towards the red end. Next up, it's our pinwheel candy cane. These guys are kind of similar. They've got a green center and you have these like white stripes radiating out from the middle. Next 123 is our lithophyllin chalice. So I've, I know you've probably heard me say many, many times, but um, chalices, I mean, that's not a real coral designation. Uh, chalices, it's a huge umbrella description that covers probably 10 different genera of corals. Echinophilia, Oxypora, uh, Mycidium, Lithophyllin. All of these corals are completely different from one another and have species that are completely different from one another. So when you're talking about general care requirements for chalice, they're all over the place. Growth rates, all over the place. Aggressiveness, hardiness, they're all over the place. So if you are going to be looking to purchase chalice, definitely try to do um, at least genus by genus study on what it's gonna take to keep them. Cause like certain ones are practically impossible. Like some of like the bubble gum, um, like uh, oh, it's I, I, I have a hard time describing them, but some of them are extremely challenging to keep, and some of them are super duper easy. So like the actual the, the blue lithophyllin here, for example, is pretty easy. Um, so Slipknot boy, the meat, the metalhead is asking, are there any plans to export to the UK in the near future? Not right now. Um, we've got an export permit. But just the logistics of shipping overseas is so expensive that it only makes sense if you're talking about tons of coral. And usually for an individual hobbyist or even a store, it's not that feasible. But it's something that we might be looking forward to in the future. Maybe. Possibly. We have the paperwork. We just don't have like the logistics to, to move that much. Okay, number 124. See, this makes me a little sad, because this is our last one. Of so my friend is named Nathan. He brought this in as his trade. We, I'm, I'm out of creative names to name stuff, so I just called it Nathan's Chalice. This chalice photographs incredibly poorly to the, to the point that I don't think it's ever sold on our site, ever. And to see it now show up this good on stream makes me just, like, so salty, because... <laughs> It's never looked this good, like ever. It's, it's so non-photogenic non and it's like such a cool coral. And I always try to like say to people, you should buy this, it looks so cool. And I can't prove it. Here's the proof. <laughs> we have like, this is probably our last one. Hopefully Nathan has more, but uh, yeah. What a cool looking chalice. And it's like only $35, huh. Huh, moving on. <laughs> we have our mystery chalice. Got four of these. Again, one of the cooler, like a kind of poor varieties. <clears throat> so for those of you asking about um, overseas stuff, um, you know, wondering about like, if an order is big enough, we can take that discussion offline. There's a chance out there, but I have, to, I have to be perfectly honest. I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to export. So we have to kind of figure that out together. Moving on. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, 126? Yeah. Strawberry Fields Chalice. Another one of like the really cool looking guys. Sometimes these are hard to, to photograph, but this guy's coming out pretty well. Nick Nelson is asking, any pectinia in the lot today? Unfortunately, no. I think that we've literally sold all of the pectinia in this whole place. I think, it, I think it's all gone. And like the last one, we sold for like a small fortune. I think it must have been like over $600. I mean, pectinia is crazy expensive now. Crazy. 
Y'all are crazy. Um, okay, moving on. 127. Having said that, I'm always looking for pectinia. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get more. But yeah, that seems to be like the, 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 the hot, new, big budget coral. It's like some of like the rainbow pectinia varieties. So yeah, Starlight Chalice, one of the coolest chalices uh, to see in person. It's like the deep, dark, uh, like purple base, like these bright green, uh, bright green, uh, like not even, they're not polyps. They're just, it's just like dots on the skin. You can see the polyps that are open right now. There's like one, two, three, four, maybe like five polyps. But like the, the skin itself has that, that star speckled look to it. Okay, moving along. Our golden eye chalice. I'll have to throw this out there. Locally, this is referred to as the Cleveland Cavalier chalice because it's yellow and red, or it should be wine and gold. I'm a huge Cavalier fan. I am still really, really, really upset about the whole Kevin Love thing. This was supposed to be our year. One of my like goals in life was to own the Cleveland Cavaliers. That was like <laughs> bucket list type stuff. <laughs> anyway, Golden Eye Chalice. All right, moving on to 129. is our lunar chalice and you can see some some uh, tentacles from uh, a brittle star at its base so he'll probably come along as a little hitchhiker but the lunar chalices are really cool like once they get larger um, sometimes they even develop rings around the individual eyes it kind of depends on lighting and size of the colony Next, we've got, or we will get to, uh, the red and green Merletti. So we'll see that in a moment. Got three of these guys available. The nice thing about Merletti is that they grow uh, much more quickly than um, than the Welsies. They they mostly tend to stay smaller in size each individual polyp, but they tend to be hardier. They grow faster. They might not have the coloration though. So this is more pink, whereas like some of the the Welsies might be like blood blood red and stuff like that. Um, the nice thing is that you can you can propagate these things like all day. And this is another one of those corals that um, if you can like find like a local fish store or two that are willing to buy these guys up, um, you can really subsidize your whole hobby just with having this in your frag tank. Okay. Next up, we're talking about 131, which is the red Blastomusa Merletti. Uh, doesn't have the green centers, so if you like that red on red look, and the polyp size on this is actually almost every bit as big as a, as a Welsey. So you can see that, that top polyp there, just how big it is. Okay, moving on, 132. Is one of the two trachees that we're selling. This guy's kind of got that, that, that rainbow, uh, you know, painted look to it kind of got a mix of like the reds, the, the fuchsias, the teals, the purples going on. So if you're kind of looking for that like uh, signature the space uh, taking LPS towards the bottom of your tank, you know, this is definitely something worth considering. Um, oh, we got, we got a question about the blasters. Are they easy to keep? Uh, Merletti's, I would say so. Like if you, if you can keep like a, um, a mixed reef pretty well, Merletti's should be fine. Lower light, uh, medium flow would probably be best. Uh, and Welsies, like sea crab runs having trouble with his Welsies. Welsies can be a little bit more temperamental. Sometimes they do get like uh, like weird infections and stuff. Yeah, as for like trachies, uh, placement, like I said, down towards the bottom. Uh, medium light, I tend to like T5 for coloration 
but these guys are less affected by the, the type of light than most other LPS, like the ACANs, for example, that change color like crazy. These guys don't change color as much, so under LED, I don't, I don't expect a huge drop off in, in coloration. Moving to 133 is another trachea. You can see some of the more like, uh, like greens and purples in this particular colony. You can probably see the difference in shape too, whereas one was kind of that more open brain look, whereas this one is that more closed brain look. And corals get reclassified all the time. So sometimes uh, people might refer to this as a wesophilia. And I am by no means an expert on coral taxonomy. But I do know that Wesophilia is no longer a thing to the, to the taxonomy world. They're all Tracheophilia now. So this in the past might have been called a Wesophilia radiata, but it's, it's just not anymore. They get, re, they get reshuffled all the time depending on different traits. 134. is the first of our two Miami Lobos. So you can see the Miami colors, the, uh, the orange coming out. Actually, the University of Miami is orange and green. Why the heck are these things called Miami Lobos? I don't know. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, 135 is our other Miami Lobo. Slightly smaller, slightly less expensive. Um, lobophilia are really cool because they, uh, they develop um, additional heads through longitudinal fission. Um, completely different texture, completely different growth rate than you, what you might find in trachees. But once you get like a large colony, they can be really stunning. Okay, Olga Litvinsky just got star polyps and they don't open. It's like for two days now, any reason why. I have a nano with good parameters. The rest of the corals are fine. Okay, star polyps, oftentimes they close up and then algae starts growing on their skin, which really messes with them. So what I would suggest is to, to, to blow them off with like a turkey baster or something like that, and then basically uh, put them at the, you know, like right near a, a power head and just get them like as much flow as you can in your nano um, because that tends to help them get back open. 136. We've got two things going on here. Uh, orange tabastria. Uh, we put some food in so you can kind of see them extended, but they're getting blown a, a little bit hard. Which one? Yeah, uh, so we, we've got another one it's, that's not going to be for sale. But the, those are the two that are for sale. But uh, we're going to show you real quick um, one that's completely open, just so you can see what it looks like when it's fully open. Um, it's uh, kind of weird to see, not weird, but it's less common to see tra uh, Tabastria open during the day, because they're, they're a nocturnal coral. So in order to get them to get open during the day it actually takes some training so we've been feeding these guys regularly uh, during the day roughly at the same time and that's why you're seeing them open so in your tank uh, depending on your feeding schedule it's going to take some time to get these guys to open during the day and be eating and you do have to feed tabastria because they're a non photosynthetic coral so all of their energy comes from the food that you give them the more often the better <coughs> Okay, so moving along, we had our orange tabastria, and then now this is 136, which is an orange dendrophilia. 137, orange dendrophilia. It's similar to um, the tabastria. It's a different genes, guys, to eat, but they also have a month. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just going to talk for a little bit. I don't know if the feed is back up, but I, hopefully it is. Uh, just let me know if uh, you guys can see me again.
I had I started and and and, and uh, restarted my um, my broadcast thing. Okay, back up. Yeah. All right. Thanks for letting me know. So hopefully we didn't miss too much. Okay. Uh, what? What? Uh, actually, let's go back to 137 real quick. Okay. Orange dendrophilia. It's a slightly different structure than the tabastria. Um, but it's a little bit more difficult to feed. So you kind of have to, to be a little bit more patient with it. It too is a non-photosynthetic. So prepare to feed it at least you know, once or twice a day for, for, best, uh, for best growth. Okay, now we'll move on, 138. Okay, so somebody says there's a sound delay. Ray Corville says there's a sound delay. How do I sound, you guys? Am I right? Or does it look like I'm like dubbed like in a kung fu movie? Hopefully. Okay, so Tony Nguyen asks, what do you suggest feeding um, the non-photosynthetic guys? Um, when it comes to those guys, it doesn't even matter. They'll eat anything. They'll eat flakes, they'll eat like pellet food, they'll eat frozen food, anything. Just get them eating. That's, uh, that's the most important thing. Okay. So you know what I'm going to do? I am going to um, stop and restart my stream again. Uh, so this will take one second. Hopefully, uh, it's better. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, hey, it's a live show. Do what we can. <laughs> um, let's just move on. 139. Uh, we've got our Harlequin Cephastria. So this guy is going to look a little bit different once he fully opens. Um, we've got, it's a purple base. And it's got a red center to the polyp, but it's, it has yellow, uh, yellow tentacles once they're fully expanded. So that's where like the Harlequin uh, thing looks like. Huh, still got sink issues. Weird. Yeah, so actually I'm gonna, one, I'm gonna try one last thing. Um, Uh, I'm going to okay is this any better hopefully that may might have fixed the sinking possibly we'll see okay <clears throat> 139, okay. Okay, so Sea Crab Run is asking, Cephastria, is it's an SPS similar to what? They're not really similar to anything. They're actually a low light SPS. So let me know in chat if you can even hear me at all, but hopefully you can. We'll go on to 141 in the meantime. 140? 140, not 141. What? Okay, go ahead and swap it. Yeah, we really only have about like a, a dozen corals left to go, so we'll just do it karate style. <coughs> Yeah, I don't know what happened to the sink issues. You know what? Oh, it's wait, so Olga says that it's okay now? 
Oh, that's creepy. So Ray Corville, we just want to look at you. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. So I don't know. Audio might be better. I'm not really sure. We'll see. All right, so what number are we on, Matthew? Okay, so 140 is the pink cephastria. Again, cephastria is a low light coral. You'll definitely want to give it some shade. Uh, let's move on, 141. Uh, the purple people eater cephastria. We've got three of these guys. Um, this guy's a little barnacle on it, in fact. Um, you can see right in the middle there. Otherwise, like, you know, like the purple and green look, very cool. And yes, cephastria are encrusting. All right, 142 is the green-eyed cephastria. You've seen that on our site a few times. Okay, next, we're blowing through these last few here is our Mardi Gras cephastria. A lot of variations on purple and green, but you can see that they're all different. One forty-four. It's not a cephastria, but it's a leptastria. These guys need a little bit more light, um, but they're kind of like that, that same colonial uh, polyp. Um, Sometimes people call them an LPS, sometimes people call them an SPS. I guess it doesn't really matter because it's very middle of the road in terms of care, medium flow, medium light. You can feed them small bits of food and it's an encrusting, um, it's an encrusting piece. 145. Um, we totally ran out of names, so this is just some random Favia. Could be a Favites, possibly, but I think it's a Favia. Or it could be a Ganiastria. <laughs> I, I did a video on these where I, I tried to like, you know, differentiate them. I, I don't know. I'm bad at taxonomy when it comes to this sort of thing. Okay, moving on. 140. Um, this is the Midnight Princess Favites. We've been selling this for a really long time. Like, uh, depending on the season, the centers get even darker, so it almost looks like only green and black, rather than like that deep, deep, uh, deep, deep blue. Purple. Purple. Okay, 147. We have our marble favia. Favia tend to grow pretty slowly, so you kind of have to uh, keep an eye on that. It's one of the slowest LPS, just in my experience. Um, you can feed them and everything. They don't eat quite as well as some of the other corals, like you might expect, like an acan or something. But you can feed them, but they still typically grow kind of slowly. Favites, uh, the smaller polyp guys, tend to grow much more quickly. Okay, 148 is the dragon soul favia. Probably the most popular. Um, it's got a purple, green, and like a magenta. There we go, yeah. So we got five of those available. Again, slow growing, Australian, kind of like hard to come by sometimes, depending on the season. But um, yeah, easily the most popular of our Favias. Okay. Next, we've got 149 is our prism. Again, another Aussie favorite. A little bit more muted in coloration, but they've got kind of got like cool speckles and stuff like that. So uh, Noah on stream is asking, I got a pipe organ coral from you guys about the time of the last live sale, which is probably like, what, a month ago? And it just opened up today. Is that normal? It can be, actually. Like, pipe organs, they can be rough in shipping and they can be rough in adjusting to a new aquarium. 
Um, I would just recommend like a lot of flow. But the fact that it's opened back up now is great. Because so sometimes like those things can uh, transport rough. Okay, 150. We have our pink Ganyapora. We just started fragging these guys up like fairly recently. They're, they're still doing really well for us. For whatever reason, the pink ones seem to do really well for us, whereas the green ones tend to struggle. Um, you should know that Ganyapora uh, are one of the corals that have a very bad reputation in the hobby, and it's a very well-deserved bad reputation. Um, it's, it's many colonies, uh, they come in, they live for about three to six months, and they just crash, get like, some infection and die. Um, and a lot of that depends on the, on the species that you get, because there's like about 20 or so different species of these. And certain ones are like completely doomed to die, whereas others are actually pretty stable. The pink ones are kind of middle of the road in that regard, but you should know that like they are known for being um, a little bit testy. So yeah, just pay attention to that. We try to keep them as long as we can. Uh, the pink ones tend to sell out fairly quickly. So like the ones we've kept for the longest are probably like over like a year and a half. But another thing is, okay, on my YouTube channel, find um, the video where I'm talking about one of my customer's tank. His name's Will. So just like look for like Will's Reef Tank or something. Um, he bought one of my, my, uh, my pinks, or maybe it's a red. And in his tank, it like t turned into something the size of a grapefruit and has like three to four inch long tentacles. It was incredible. And basically try to do what that guy's doing because he's far more successful than whatever we're doing here. I mean, obviously we can't duplicate a lot of what he does on this scale, but he's doing some stuff with, uh, with Zeovit now, and I think that a lot of that type of thing is helping that coral a lot. So if you're thinking of Maganis and kind of want to learn more about their care, pay attention to tell what that guy's doing in terms of, um, of care for these things, because it's working. All right, next up, 151. Okay, so number 151, 152, and 153 are all elegances, and they're all the same price. So we'll just like go over each one just to show you uh, what you see is what you get. So elegances, um, these are all Australians, and the thing about Aussies is that they tend to be pretty bulletproof. Uh, for a while there, they were coming from Indonesia, and um, they really struggled from that geography for like a long, long time. They would kind of get this, uh, this cottony infection after like a couple months and would just not do well. And there was a lot of speculation as to why that was. But long story short, there's a period where I just didn't get elegances. And I think that period was for about 10 years until Australia opened up its export of these things. And we're back uh, to some of the most bulletproof um, iconic large polyp stony corals. So um, that one there that you're seeing is 153. Let's go back to 152 again. 152 is a little bit more green on its face, a little bit less uh, speckle or the, that striping going on, less of that more uh, uniform green. And 151 is kind of like a hybrid of the two, but it kind of has like this, this ring of purple going on. So you kind of have like your choice of those three elegances. And these elegances, I'm going to guess, are about three to four inches. Um, they grow really fast, though. So it's not uncommon within a year to have these things double in size. And OK, so Noah, um, I'm going to mess up your name. Pekilni, Noah, um, how big are they and how big do they get? They can get ginormous. It, like, three feet, four feet long. I mean, they can get huge. Um, and even from like a small skeleton, their flesh can expand to huge uh, sizes. These guys are still fairly small, but um, yeah, expect them to be in the six inch range in no time. And they eat very well and readily. So one little trick that I kind of discovered with Australian uh, elegances is to just kind of put them in a corner of the tank where there's like flow kind of going past them. So whenever you feed, a lot of that stuff that kind of like hugs the, uh, it's a fly, 
um, that hugs the, uh, the kind of the, the glass of your aquarium makes it into these guys so they always get uh, passively fed. So that's my suggestion there. Um, oops, I made a mistake. Oops. So yeah, that's kind of what I would suggest is in, in terms of just getting them regular food. Otherwise you can directly feed them. They grab stuff out of the water really, really easily. Are they aggressive towards other tank inhabitants? Yeah, they eat snails. Um, I should have mentioned that. They're really, 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 really good at eating snails, and for some reason, snails are really, 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 really good at finding their way into elegances. It's, it's one of the weird things. So, yeah, 153 plus multiples, uh, that's like over 400 corals that we probably went over in the last uh, two and a half hours. We did it, guys. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, hope to do this again later. Um, it might be a little while. I'm not really sure. The next one isn't scheduled. Like we actually scheduled this one well in advance. Um, so hopefully we'll do one in the next month to two months. I'll definitely keep you posted like through our newsletter, through um, social media, uh, the, and yeah, just just stay in touch. We'll, we'll we'll get you guys notified the next time we do one of these things. So uh, last minute questions. Let's see if there's anything in chat. Uh, not so much. Uh, we're, we're actually, okay, so going back to the whole Ganiapora thing, um, a lot of people are having uh, some good success with carbon dosing, which makes sense because carbon dosing uh, increases like uh, the bacterial load that's like in the water column. And it's speculated that a lot of corals um, eat uh, bacteria directly out of the water. And that's like a major food source that they can get like up to like 30% of their uh, nutritional value every day from that. So, uh, yeah, something to, to pay attention to. We tried carbon dosing here with vodka. It didn't work out so well, but vodka is, is pretty harsh. There's other methods that are more gentle but more expensive that doesn't make sense to do it in 1,000-gallon systems. But, uh, yeah, hopefully, um, like, you guys will kind of, like, figure that out and you can post your results to show show others in the future, um, you know, how to handle some of these more difficult and challenging corals. All right, guys, time is up. I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. My throat definitely has. So I will talk to you guys later. <laughs>